This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Thanks again for joining us this week for this video of the our podcast that we have been doing here recently. I hope that you're enjoying the video component of our podcast. And if you do, I'd appreciate if you could just leave your comments down below here at, uh, on YouTube. So this way you can let me know you're enjoying this and you want me to continue because this does take a little bit of extra time for me to actually put together these videos. Uh, again, the podcast is something I spend most of my time uh, putting together and editing in post-production as well as just the production of the begin with and to arrange for the guests and everything. But anyhow, uh, these little things take a little bit extra time. So if you like them, please let me know so I'll know whether or not to continue this kind of uh, video uh, recording. Uh, while you are on YouTube, by the way, please subscribe to this podcast. So I'd appreciate if you would subscribe to uh, my channel. So this way, whenever we do have some new content that comes on, you will be notified that we are either going live with something or something new has been posted on this YouTube channel. Also, I suggest, if you will, please, to go to themagicwordpodcast.com, and that is a place where you can go to subscribe to the pod letter. And if you, uh, this week, we are uh, hoping to get to a thousand subscribers on the pod letter. We are just uh, literally four people short of reaching that 1,000. And so if you happen to be the person who is the 1,000th person, I will mention your name in the next in the next week's uh, podcast. So all you have to do is go to themagicwordpodcast.com. There you will see a place where you can subscribe to the pod letter. Should be a screen that pops up, or you can perhaps just go to the little tab on the side of the screen and uh, where it says subscribe, and you can, you'll, you'll figure, figure it out from there, I believe. won't be that difficult. Well, as I said, this week uh, I'm going to be doing this video with my guest, Doc Eason, and I want to apologize a little bit for the quality of this. I was recording this on Skype, and the reason is when I record on Skype, I have the ability to split the channels uh, left and right, and so I can do a little bit of editing on one channel or the other uh, by, by having the stereo split out that way. When we put the thing together, however, uh, apparently they combined both of our videos, and so we're kind of close together. So while we were talking, we were centered in the middle of the screen, but you will notice as you're starting to watch this, it seems like that, like in particular in Doc's case, that you see about half of his face all the time. But uh, I, anyhow, I think you'll enjoy this uh, as well. So he has a lot of stories he's going to tell you about the beginning of uh, his uh, bar magic career. Some of you have heard this, some haven't. He's working on a new book that is his life story. He's also going to uh, talk about uh, winning his awards at uh, the Magic Castle for the Academy of Magical Arts for the Best Bar Magician. Uh, anyhow, so many different things. I'm going to step out of the way and introduce you to this week's guest. Please welcome Mr. Doc Eason here on The Magic Word. Today I've got with me someone who is a longtime friend, someone who I haven't had a chance to get together with for a while, and I thought that we'd try to reconnect, and uh, I called him the other day and said, hey, let's get together, and he said, you bet, and it's somebody that uh, you guys have known for a long time, you know him, you've seen him, you loved him, uh, and of course that he's just was a towering figure, uh, pun intended, in oh. the... Colorado Magic Scene at the uh, Tower Bar and Grill of John Denver's from way back when. And we'll talk a little bit about that then as well. And of course, um, he was such a multi-winner of the Bar Magician of the Year Award, the Magic Castle, that they finally just retired it and said, okay, there's no one. It's just going to be you. <laughs> and so please welcome my very good friend, one of my I, best friends. That's not quite <laughs> Doc Eason. Uh, th thanks uh, for the intro. Uh, but to, just to correct it, make sure that uh, nobody gets their pennies in the twist. He only gave it out two years. Two years. Okay, that was enough, huh? <laughs> Whit was Whit Hayden was the second guy. Pop and and it was then they realized that in terms of bar magic, uh, there's you, there's about five guys you know that we can name off the top of our head, and so we would just be in the award around this small circle of friends, and so uh, <laughs> it was their decision, not mine. But uh, I, I, I sort of enjoy the uh, 
a distinction of having a winning bar magician of the year for the first time it was that, that it was ever offered so uh, anyway that just want to make sure that uh, that if, if uh, pop hayden is listening here he knows that i'm setting the record straight here i, I you know yeah anyway. pop i know that uh, mike Pachata is, is great and uh, a few other guys who have uh, uh, who are bar magicians you're right there really is just a handful of guys who i think have been uh, bar magicians yeah uh, you know Chef in the traditional sense yeah, in the, in the traditional sense. And, you know, Bill Malone, of course, for sure. Um, anyway, uh, be that as it may, that's, that's, uh, all the awards are nice. I'm still not sure how to, uh, what to do with them. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I mean, what the, I, I've been awarded the, uh, you know, the thing by my peers, and that was good. And I didn't, it wasn't a campaign thing. It wasn't a competition thing. It was just, I don't know, right. they did. So anyway, um, be that as it may, it's there in the, in the trophy along with the two, uh, but you've been doing that at the Magic Castle there at the W.C. Fields Bar for a number of years, uh, ever since they probably first opened that bar. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, uh, Eric Mead and I uh, were booked into the um, close-up room, and I don't remember the year on this thing. I'd have to look it up. Um, <clears throat> so we were working the, uh, um, uh, the close-up room, and... Uh, about midway through the week, the, the plan was, it wasn't a surprise to us, but the, the, the plan was uh, that they had to redo all the seats in the close-up gallery. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was going to be a couple of days, you know. And so, I, you know, is, is there any way we could put you maybe perhaps in the bars to see if that would work out while we, you know, do the construction work? And, of course, it was gangbusters, even though the bar was not retrofitted to the, uh, the extent that it is now. Uh, mm -hmm. But... Uh, one, two days after, you know, the, the, the project got started, we went two days, uh, and then on the third day, they said, okay, uh, the, uh, the close-up gallery is all set for you to go back into, and, and we both said, hey, could we just uh, stay in the bar, because uh, it's, it's a lot more fun, and uh, so I was, uh, again, Pop Hayden had, a, had a, a, some input on that whole thing. But uh, and then they eventually reworked the whole thing so that the, the sinks were gone and you could actually get right up to the bar and they had a platform. We had a, you know, suddenly we got a PA system that we could you know, we could work with, and it was it was it's uh, it continues to be one of my favorite venues in the world to work. Um, you know, it's the Magic Castle, and uh, if for some reason it's no longer the WC Fields Bar. There's reasons for that, I'm sure we could go into, but I'd rather not. Uh, and it's now called the Library Bar. Okay. <laughs> they want you to be quiet, I guess, there, right? I, they, 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 that didn't work. <laughs> That's what they were saying. That didn't work. Because uh, we, we whip and shout down there. And it, the, uh, that room is, um, you know, the, uh, for those of you who've been to the castle before, you know that the shows go off, you know, pretty much on the numbers. Uh, because there know, are some people, by the way, who are listening worldwide who have every intention, and that's one of their longtime goals in life is to make it to the Magic Castle. Have never visited, so if you want to give some more detail about that and how the shows work and the intermittence of, of them and everything, why don't you can describe that a little bit more? Well, um, the uh, the three major showrooms: there's the close-up gallery, there's the parlor of prestidigitation, and then there's the palace of mystery, uh, the big room, um, and. Um, uh, the the close-up gallery has about 27 seats in it. Um, and, uh, the uh, parlor has, I think, 50, 55, maybe you know, standing room only, maybe 60 people in there. And then, of course, the big room, the Palace of Mystery, has uh, uh, 125. And so, uh, but they go off on the numbers. You know, the eight o'clock start, boom, they're they're you know because the the whole thing is running pretty tight. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, you get a guy like me in there who can't do a half an hour. It's got to be another. Like, can we get another ten minutes, maybe a, you know, forty minutes or something. Anyway, um, uh, so they, they've allowed me and and everybody else down there basically uh, to just kind of run long, let it let it go. You know, if we're having fun, we don't have to curtail it because oh, it's eight o'clock. We got to stop and reset for the next show. Uh, it's just it's it's more freewheeling. Yeah. And, a lot more fun as far, as far as I'm concerned because um anybody, and it's a real bar I mean they're serving drinks down there also just like you did at the tower right right you are and that's that and that's one of the way one of the ways that I got Milt's attention was that you know hey we could make a lot of money out of this joint and um 
So John Armstrong and myself, I think, are buying, you know, neck and neck in terms of the highest numbers to be turned into that particular, you know. But I'd stock it full of Hollywood type. Uh, pals of mine and it was just it's it's a grand grand fun thing um it's also you don't do seven days you do five days uh, wednesday through sunday and mm -hmm. so uh, monday and tuesday it's uh, generally dark well they have the hat and hair pub which is a lot smaller oh, over there another great bar i know that mike pashada has worked there for years uh yes. but uh kind of as a resident bartender there but uh there are only so many people who can get packed in that room unlike there at the library bar where that not only do they have seating but you can kind of be standing outside the area for people yeah. to to watch yeah yeah, uh, that's an important distinction. Uh, the Hat and Hair Pub, Mike does an unbelievable job there. Mm -hmm. he, he's got it down. It's so, sort of like he kind of kind of grew into the room, sort of like I grew into the tower. It was just sort of like, okay, we're going to make a little course correction here, course correction here, and now you know he gets that first row all served and and, and crushes them with his magic. Mike is unbelievable. Um, so yeah, he's definitely uh, one of the other. Uh, Bar, bar magicians that would be worthy of, of note. But, um, you know, I, I, it's interesting. I guess at 73 years old, I'm, 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 I'm becoming part of the old guard. And I'm really, <laughs> uh, you know, this, these new young whippersnappers there that are coming up with, a, you know, the trick a minute, their trick, a, trick per DVD, and, you know, all that other stuff. I guess that's where magic's going. Um, I can't buck the, the trend, and you know I'm I'm, not, I'm too old to fight anymore. You know. Um, <laughs> well, you joined it whenever that you put out your DVD about the card under glass, uh, which was really good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I, and and I, I've just been in touch with somebody who uh, I'm starting to give lessons to using that that DVD set as a uh, as a basis of uh, where to start. Yeah. Uh, as that as you well you know the uh, this performance and then there's theory and then there's there's technique the toolbox and um uh, so um it, it, it ain't dead yet but i but uh, it's uh, especially these days with the covid thing you know mm -hmm. uh, so i mean i used to work the castle t two or three times a year for for a week because uh, and sometimes two weeks um they could because i sold whiskey down there and you know it, it added <laughs> thing and the, 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 the numbers guy on the third floor said, "Hey, this guy is pretty good. Keep him around." And so, um, uh, it, it it's just well, my home, and it, it's I'm I'm missing it terribly. And I and plus all my friends out there. That's what I remember uh, about also at the tower about how that you would keep a great audience, but then you would stop and say, well, "What was it you were drinking over there, Slick? You know, and Stephen, that you got something." And I think, uh, and what was that guy's name that worked behind the bar with you, S Bolt or Flash or Speedy or what was that guy's? Zoom, 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 zoom. <laughs> That's kind of uh, um, uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Zoom. Well, over the 27 years that I was at the tower, we had a lot of different guys kind of re revolve in and out of that backup position. Some yeah. of them take to it like a duck to water. Uh, others that you know, they'd want to hang back because they, 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 you know, they, and they, you know, they served a purpose. But when you had the lively guy attending bar along with it and we'd be trading lines back and forth and and any i was had this discussion i um let me think where do i start this thing um i'm writing a book about my experiences at the tower it's not a trick book uh i do discuss uh, certain uh, certain tricks but not specifically this is more of a, of a souvenir book for my patrons than than uh, magicians but i think magicians would get something out of it but the the, the whole idea of working every single night you know, I mean, I five, mm -hmm. you know, um, boy, it's uh, it's a grind. First of all, some great stuff comes out of it, but it's it's uh, it's it's hard work. Um, I got, you know, I used to do it five nights a week, and then I with them when Eric Mead joined the team, um, we did it. Um, each of us did four nights. In other words, one of the nights we'd over we'd be there together. Um, uh, it, uh, but I just remember that what you were saying is GTFM was one of your right. uh, slogans back then of trying to get the money and also to sell drinks because that's why you're at the bar is to make the money by them buying drinks. So it's not just about watching the magic, but so that's why I thought it was interesting that you could stop mid trick and say, wait a minute, I want to make sure this guy's got his beers low. He needs another one over here. So bring him another one, yeah. you know, well, that's, that's, uh, well, that's the reason we're there. Exactly. 
Right, same, same thing like with trade shows. We're there to try to sell the company's business. We're not there to entertain. You know, if we're paid to be entertained to come in after dinner or something, you know, that's one thing or a cocktail party. But when you're at a professional establishment or you're working in a trade show, you are there trying to sell the company and trying to make money for the company. And yes. I think that, that you found that secret way back then. Oh, yeah, that wasn't, I, it was a discovery that I made, but it, it was, I certainly didn't originate it. Uh, yep. He have an Al. Uh, Al Andrucci from uh, from uh, Chicago, and in, in the, the glory days of Magic Bar, um, uh, Heba have Al. Heba have Al. Did you ever yeah. get to work? I did. I did. Saw him lecture once. Mm -hmm. Oh, I would love to have seen that. Love yeah. to have seen. That. He may be on video. Charlie McFarland may have a copy of that. Ooh, well, that would be interesting. Um, McFarland was actually here at Basalt at one point. He called me up, but you know, out of the clear blue, I thought it was a crank call. You know, <laughs> well, see Charlie McFarland and Dave Fields many years ago in Midland, Texas, hosted a convention uh, called Close Up for Connoisseurs, and right. Eba Haba Al was one that they brought in along with uh, Martin Nash, uh, and they had uh, 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 Daryl uh, and Michael Lamar, uh, Phil Wilmarth, Roger Klaus, Eugene Berger. It was an amazing convention, yeah. <laughs> and I believe that he recorded some of the things, and so he may have a copy of Heba performing and lecturing. What a treat. Uh, you know, uh, Magic Bar is difficult to define because um, there's so many different uh, factors that go into it. You know, uh, if you work outside the bar, in, in the bar room area, but not behind the bar, do you be, are you behind the bar working? Uh -huh. Uh, are you selling whiskey or you're not selling whiskey? Um, and uh, very few bars that I've run into are designed for a guy like me or any other magic bartender for that matter. You know, the perfect place to work the entire room is right here in front of the sinks. The guy's got to do the dishes here, you know, so you can't, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's tough. It's just not an automatic plug in. This is a great idea. Let's do this. You know, right. I did that one time. Um, it's difficult to define it. So, you, you know, you, you're going to have to get in there and it kind of rework it to, uh, to what's going to make it work for you. Um, so uh, luckily, the tower was ideal. Um, did know, John like, Denver actually find you? Well, actually, I guess that was already going. And Bob Sheets was there. Is that right? Way back whenever you first came in. Right. Sheets, Sheets was there. Sheets uh, turned it into a magic bar in 1975 when... Uh, uh, the boys, the management team there, talked John into signing his name on the lease and and uh, making it, uh, you know, uh, the Tower Bar, the Tower, you know, fondue. It used to be the Tower fondue. When the boys mm -hmm. bought it, uh, when John bought it for the boys, um, it just became the Tower. And it was uh, American food, you know, the wonderful steaks, uh, crab legs, uh, sauces, you know, chicken with sauce and, and um, a couple other, you know, various. But it was really just a pretty fine dining, I would say, you know, um, maybe not fine dining, just damn good food, basically. Yeah. Um, and so, um, uh, so John didn't, John had nothing to do with me. Uh, I, you know, I was friends with these three guys and three guys that uh, started the tower. Um, and, um, I, I knew them from Palo Alto and, and, uh, and, um, uh, Cupertino, they were uh, fraternity brothers at San Jose State, and um, and I knew them, you know, kind of peripherally. Um, and uh, but, but my buddy that I came out here with, Jeffrey Jacobs, and Jake, to all his friends, um, uh, were, were good pals with these guys. And so we decided let's take a motorcycle ride and go out there. I was uh, going to turn 30 years old uh, on the 22nd of July. Uh, so on 7 7 77, that's July 7th, 1977, uh, Jake and I got on our motorcycles and cruised across the desert to uh, uh, Snowmass, Colorado, and walked into the bar that night, going to have a big celebratory welcome dinner with all the boys. Now, I didn't know any magic at all. I, you know, I mean, I'd stop and watch a guy do the linking rings or something, throw him a buck, but I, mm -hmm. I knew nothing about magic. Um, in fact, I'm just kind of fine tuning this, uh, the, the experience of seeing behind, you know, sitting at the bar and watching this lunatic behind the bar go, <laughs> um, you know, he'd say, uh, for example, um, he seemed like he, he asked me, uh, what, what would you like to drink? And I said, I'll have a Heineken. He went, oh, wait a minute, Heineken, huh? Oh, wait a second, hold on a second. He took a pad of paper and he wrote Heineken on it, ripped it off, let, uh, you know, stuck it on the beer bottle and gave it to me. 
He said, you want a clean glass or a dirty glass? Now, I'd never, what? <laughs> I mean, I'd never seen anything at all like this. Yeah. And then, you know, and then uh, if you've ever seen Bob when he's, you know, <laughs> unplugged, um, he's, he's all over the map. Uh, water? You want water? <laughs> the bar. Hold on a minute. And he walked down, he'd get a glass, and he'd push the ice in it just like a snow cone, just as much as he could get in there. Yeah. Drip water in it and then put a straw in it and a, a whipped cream and a cherry on top and then deliver it to the person. Now, <laughs> these people don't know what's going on. And the rest of the bar, of course, are familiar with Bob. And they know he's crazy. Uh, they're on their floor laughing. <laughs> uh, it was, I sat at that bar for uh, 20 minutes before we went back for our big dinner thing. And he, he didn't do any magic during that 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe 18 minutes because eventually he did a couple of things, but um, but it, the the first part of it was just the pre preparation of the drinks and walking up and down selling GTFM. Get the get money. Yeah, exactly. So uh, and so uh, now this appealed to the salesman to me because I I was uh, prior to this uh, adventure I was working in um, a health food store in San Jose Cupertino California actually, and uh, there was a, a lunch counter there a bar. Um, now, obviously, the product line is way different. You know, this was we were serving nature burgers and smoothies and <laughs> and what have you. Um, but uh, but the pace is the same. It's it's it's, uh, you know, I recognize the customer. I see you. I'm going to get to you right away. Keeping track of the orders in my mind and all the rest sure. of that stuff. So I, I didn't realize it, but that I was in training. One of the things that, that really uh, kind of help me get into this whole situation. When I was working at the, uh, the health food store, you know, I'd take home a trade magazine or something and I'd look through and I'd read about ginseng or got, you know, uh, ginkgo biloba or whatever, whatever the supplement that I was, that I was reading about was. So the next day I'd go into the, into, into work and I'd set up by the register, I'd set up a little pyramid with all these bottles of whatever vitamin I was hawking that day. And uh, so once the once the bar uh, filled up with uh, lunch patrons and they're all munching away on their nature burgers, uh, I'd go into the the ginseng show or you know whatever. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd start talking to the person here right here at first base. But everyone down the bar is you know like eating their sandwich, staring at me, going, "Yeah," and it you know it helps for psoriasis and whatever you know. And so when I saw Bob work. It was like, Jesus, you know, I've already been in training for this. I sort of know how to do this. Now, I got, I had to learn how to make a whiskey sour and a gin and tonic and, you know, the different kinds of, you know, I had sure. to learn the bar. But in terms of the pace, phew, I was just I, I, I'm ready for it. Just jump, send me in, coach. I know the place. And um, so that's, so when that, when, when the, uh, the week-long vacation turned into two weeks and turned into three weeks and suddenly it was like, I'm not leaving to go back to California. This is heaven, you know. Forget heaven. Uh, uh, forget West Virginia. This is this was heaven, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So it was. Uh, it was. But you didn't know any magic still at that time. I didn't know any magic, and so I got you know I got a job as a waiter. But every you know in the, the restaurant for, for the off season it was pretty slow. So every ch chance I had, I'd go back to the bar door and watch what Bob was doing, and um, then. Um, through some set of circumstances, he left and I, I stayed there at the bar. Uh, he went into Aspen to, to open up a place called the Jolly Jester, which was another legendary because he'd take all of that shtick that he had that he'd go down yeah. there and he'd hooked up with uh, you know, Steve Spill, mm -hmm. uh, J.C. Wagner, uh, and he had these guys come out and help him open up this this uh, this new magic bar, this new magic place. Well, I mean, I, I, no, I didn't know J.C., I, you know, I didn't know Spill. I didn't yeah. know anything. But this turned out, they, they turned out to be the um, the faculty of my magic college. You know, we'd hang out during the day, you know, um, doing what we do here in Colorado, Rocky Mountain High and all that stuff, and practice these cards. <laughs> and then I'd right. get a chance to go into, into the bar and try them in the bar right in front of real people. And, um, boy, there's nothing... There's no no uh, no uh, other way of doing this than, 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 than to get this experience. You're just going to do it every single night. So I did it essentially every night for 40 years. So you, you were know? the only bartender, obviously, whenever that they all went over to the Jolly Jester at that point, because that was their full time thing, and that left a wide opening for you. Right. And Bob taught me the the, uh, the you know a real basic card trick, and 
a copper silver brass, which is still in my repertoire. Still, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every single day, I you know when I, yeah. when I, 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 I do that, and so it's, <clears throat> um, well, it's pretty exciting. Um, it, it, uh, but the Jolly Jester didn't stay open as long. In other words, that was just there for a few years, and those guys split up, or that closed, didn't it? After a few, I mean, maybe five years or so. It was even five. It might have been more like four years. Uh, basically, uh, uh, as wonderful a magician as Bob was, he was not a very good uh, money guy. And so, um, uh, you know, basically, you know, the pouring cost is, some, is supposedly somewhere around 19 percent. At there, it was like 40 percent. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's doomed. Uh, it's only so much, it's so much time until this thing is going to hit the ditch. Um, which it, it happened. It wasn't because it wasn't popular. It was roaring. But, you know, I can remember standing there and, you know, closing time and the guy from the kitchen comes back, grabs a case of beer and goes out the back door. He goes, where are you going with that? He said, well, Bob said it was okay. Well, you don't make any money with, you know, people walking out with cases right. of and so uh, it was ill-fated from the from the start, uh, and I was I was never so happy that I made the decision I did, because I was like, well, should I go to the Jolly Jester and follow the boys on there, or should I stay with John Denver and Michael Shore and all of the other people that were they were running the Tower Restaurant? And so, you know, obviously after three years they closed the doors. The Tower is charging ahead, right. um, and I, I made the right decision. I remember years ago that you and Eric had told many people about anyone who's going to be coming out and working here, or regardless, they're working the tower and helping you or wherever they're working, that they should be saving their money for the rainy day. Because during the summertime, you don't have the same kind of tourist base you do during the winter. And basically, it's the uh, the old parable of the grasshopper, you know, yeah. and the, you yeah. know, just saving money because you're going to need it. Yeah. Uh, especially in the resort area, things are more expensive here. Mm -hmm. uh, you get used to that cash flow, you know, and then suddenly, and then the off season rolls around. You know, you got we closed on approximately the fifteenth of April, and we reopened the fifteenth or so of June. That's two months, you know. And the same thing happens in the fall. It's another two months in the fall. So there's, you're only working eight months out of a twelve month a year, which uh, was why that I thought it was brilliant when you came up with the idea with the children's festival to bring in more people during that time. Yeah, well, yeah, in the I, off season. Yeah, well, uh, well, that was summer. Summertime is okay. Uh, mm. but a lot of Winnebago pilots, and uh, you know, they eat in the car, and then they, you know, they come out and and um, find out what's going on. You know, so and so the uh, it's not the same as the winter time when you have private jets lining the airport, and you know, you haven't got room for any more jets there. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, but um, so uh, the off season, and I realized that I needed to start traveling too. You know, because I get more and more people going. Hey, we're having a big party in Texas. You know, early '80s. You know, early '80s, oil was king. Of you course, know? that's people, why I think I got to know you when you came down to Texas so frequently. I ran into you a lot down here. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, it was great at that point because they had tons of money. You know, yeah, afraid to use it. You know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, so the, the, the private parties and, and eventually some trade shows and, you know, so, so something to kind of fill in those, those four months. Um, and then it bled over into, you know, I had, you know, I would leave every now and then, but I had, you know, I had a backup guy. I had Eric, you know, to, to, to stand in for me. Eric's not a bad backup guy. He's Eric pretty, Mead. <laughs> yeah, he, he can carry his weight all right, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was funny, when he came, he came up here, uh, I, first of all, it became evident, to, you know, in the uh, early 90s when I had two kids, at, you know, two boys at home uh, that I can't do this, uh, you know, at nighttime as much as, you know, I'm totally devoted to it. Um, so, all right, find somebody else. Well, mm -hmm. where are you going to find somebody else that wants to pick up stakes and move here? You know, if he hasn't got anything going wherever it is, whether it's Houston or San Antonio or St. Louis or Seattle, wherever, um, if he hasn't got anything going on with those things, but, but, well, maybe that's indicating he's not that good. Um, and so uh, I'd seen, I'd met Eric Mead at a number of different uh, magic conventions, and he was always kind of the Jack Kerouac uh, mm. uh, character. character. So just, and he was traveling around working in comedy clubs and stuff. So I approached him on it, and he said, oh, I can't do it. I've got a show in, in, in February. I have to, you know, like, well, it's December, for crying out loud. Come on. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, 
Eric was, uh, I I had to cajole him and beg him and and offer him this, that, and the other thing. And he finally relented and said, all right, I'm going to be there for one season. I'm going to start in November. I'm going to, at the end of April, I am out of here. And I went, okay, that's great. No problem. And that was about 30 years ago. And he's still. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You realize that the, 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 the sublime nature of being able to walk into a place, your your audience is there waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can try all kinds of things. I mean, this is the, uh, I didn't use it as a laboratory as much as Eric did. Um, because once I got something that worked, I just went ahead and did it. Uh, but, but you know, it, it's like the bar is a great place to, uh, it's a laboratory. Well, we'll, we'll talk about laboratory. That reminds me of a, a seminal article that Eric had written for Genie Magazine that really, if it didn't change my life, it certainly gave me pause to think that I still think about. And that was when he talked about having broken his thumb uh, in some accident, skiing or however it was. But the thing was that he couldn't do card moves. So he kind of switched to mentalism. And so he was doing some mind reading things and it caused him to slow down more Mm -hmm. and to think about interacting with the audience rather than working on the slide. So it was the presentation that became more important, as I recall. Does that kind of sound about right? Did I yeah, capsulize no. or summarize that right? Right. That's exactly right. So uh, as a result that uh, for a short time that he was, uh, I guess, kind of doing some some mentalism at the bar for yeah. for a while until his, he healed I, up. I, I, he resourceful as it was, you know, he went, it was an ando off his bicycle. You know, he just went over the handlebars and landed. That's on what it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, you know, Eric is pretty well connected in the magic world, you know, so he spent time hanging out with uh, either on the phone or in person with Max and a few other people and put together mm-hmm. a really you know, a solid show. Um, Eric is, you know, in my mind, one of the best magicians that walk in the planet these days. Yeah, yeah. He's got everything, you know. I used to say that about Tim Connell, where he got work on everything. He, he, he got the alphabet down to 23 letters. Um you know, that's the kind of in-depth uh, study that he goes. But, but you know, I don't think there's, a, there's a, another magician out there that can hold a candle to Eric. Me. Yeah, I'm anxious to uh, get the, uh, Eric's book out on Tim Conover. I know he's been working on that for a long time. And because of his attention to detail, that's going to be a classic when it comes out. Um, it's unbelievable. I mean, I you know, if, if anybody's ever seen uh, Timmy work, mm-hmm. well, you know, that's... It, it, Tim was one of the, the the best magicians on the planet. You know, he and Williamson and, and Eric Mead are you know are right in there, right in the the deal. I'm proud to know all of those guys. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, speaking of the the bar, and you have had to have had a lot of stories, which are going to be in the book, I'm sure, of yeah. things that have happened that have been pretty crazy uh, for a night where maybe somebody's been drunk and you've had to throw them out, or maybe not. You got a couple things on in your mind or something's coming up in the book you can think of? Well, that was, uh, yeah, there was, uh, well, there's, uh, there's 43 years of stories. Um, yeah. uh, pick one. Um, so it's Opre ski time. Okay. And mm-hmm. lifts shut down at four dinner doesn't start till six. Uh, people start drinking and, and uh, re- replaying their days and how much fun they had. And mm-hmm. so uh, I'm working there and um, there's a group of people, friends of one of the managers of the place uh, from Cape Cod. Uh, you know, the, there's obviously wintertime in, in Cape Cod, so there's nobody doing anything there. <clears throat> so, um, so I'm entertaining this little group down there and there's a, there's a dark skinned girl there. She's just, beautiful um lola was her name and just as and she had a great sense of humor and a wonderful laugh it was infectious and everything was going on great and at the far end of the bar there was a, a, a couple of big guys you know hunkered down there and they were making overt racial comments it just mm. it did not inappropriate fit. yeah it didn't fit we're here to having a good time what what is this wow you know, so uh you know, I'd go down there, I'd serve a drink, and I'd walk away, and I'd, you know, I'd hear some derisive laughter. Or, you know, it was just like, what, what, what's going on with this? You know, so finally he got up and left, and Lola and the gang went in the back, 
and I, I'm completely weirded out now. It's you know six six thirty. The, 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 the rush is starting, and I'm I'm, it, I'm just off center because of this this weird thing. I don't you know you don't expect to run into that in the ski resort. Where everybody's just having fun. Sure. You know? Um. So, in the meantime, a friend of mine comes in. He's a doctor, um, and I explained to him the situation, and um, what, what what had just happened. And uh, he said, uh, um, just uh, we're in the middle of this conversation when the door opens and here comes this guy again, the ringleader of that whole thing. Now, he didn't have his posse behind him, all right, but he was clearly um, reloaded for bear. Right, yeah, he was he was drunk, uh, you know, and and uh, and so uh, he wanders up. I leave Dr. Keith by uh, by himself, I walk over behind the bar and um. I hear the guy say, uh, hi, my name is Al, and I want to be your friend. And with that conversation previously, you know, Dr. Keith looked at his hand, looked up at him, looked at his hand, said, no, I got enough friends, thanks. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just like going, whoa, wait a minute, what's going to happen here? So he turns, you know, there's nobody in there that's thinking like he is. So he spins around, goes out the door. You know, well, by, na- by now it's nine o'clock. And I'm just, you know, I, this is not going to work tonight, okay? You know, mm-hmm. this, this, it, my whole day is in the ditch. I can't do it. So I get out of the office, and I'm getting my stuff together to leave. And the barmaid at the time uh, calls me on the second line in the office. Said, Doc, don't go. He's back, and he's got a gun. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Chris, terrific. Now, the bar is clear except for one guy at the end and then Al. And... Um, Sitting at the far end of the bar, and I'm I come up and I'm I'm trying to give some moral support to Carol, who's flipping out at this point, you know. The bartender, uh, I mean the barmaid. Bar, barmaid. So when it, when it, when when he I heard he's got a gun, I hung up and I immediately called the police, which are you know right around the corner. Um, however, it took him a long time to get there. Um, so Al and this other guy are having a little conversation on there. And just, you know, if the cop comes in and I hear this thunk hit the ground. And I thought, I don't know what that is exactly. But so the, you know, I said, that's the guy. That's the guy over there. That's the guy. <laughs> so, he, so Randy, the cop, walks around the corner and looks down and starts to pick up. It, it just picks up this this um, cannon. It was a 357 Magnum. Oh, my gosh. This is, you know, I mean, it's, it's the side of the building off, you know. Um, and so the cop has the gun in his hand, and old Al at least had the presence of mind said, "No, I don't know where it came from." Well, there's two uh-huh. guys are one of them is you, and the other guy that had, you know, that, that you know. So anyway, he uh, he was escorted out of there. Uh, he, I'd see him on Facebook. I recognize his face, but uh, we don't we don't converse. We don't send Christmas cards or anything to each other. <laughs> was he hauled off to jail? I assume, or uh, he was they, they, they tank? talking to, and they confiscated his gun. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so you know, and so I think he realized that this is probably not the best place to. Spot yeah, why off. would you? Why would you travel with a gun to go to a vacation resort with that kind of a gun? That just is amazing. Well, it is. I mean, you know, a, a pop gun, perhaps you know, something that fits into your belt or something. But you know, have you ever seen a three fifty seven Magnum? <laughs> Pretty darn like big. The hand, it's a cannon for crying out loud. <laughs> um, yeah, and then there's you know there's all kinds of other stories, but. Probably, if you don't mind, indulge me one a little bit further. Um, the thing that kind of was a paradigm shift for me um, was I finished the show. It was a big, the room was full. It was like crazy, yada, yada, yada. And uh, we'd fallen behind on the business end of the bar. So I went down there and I was helping the other bartender pour drinks. And, you know, we we're trying to get caught up and, you know, get the money. Sure. Uh, and as I'm, looking at the orders and I'm looking at the thing and I'm, I'm get, uh, setting up the glasses and stuff. A lady comes up, you know, at, right, right there at the service end of the bar. And uh, she said, thank you. I, I just want to thank you. And I said, well, no problem. I'm glad you had a good time. Uh, come back and see us again. You know, and I've got, sure. I've got, like, got one eye on her and one eye on the on making drinks. Sure. And so um, she stood there for a little bit longer than I felt was normal. And at one point she reached over and grabbed my hands, both of them. Now, this is hard to uh, pour whiskey when somebody's holding on to you. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, she said, no, you don't understand. I have terminal cancer. I didn't want to come on this vacation. My friends dragged me along. I sure didn't want to come to a bar. 
you know, this just was not on my agenda. But I just want to let you know I had more fun than I, I laugh more than I have in months. And right now I don't hurt. Thank you. I had to back room. I, I was I was just like, like, damn. That gets your oh, attention. What? You know, I, up until that point, I was just a guy doing a couple of clever, how does a teller put it? A, a clever guy that learned to do a few cool things. That's it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, making money and have, we're all having fun. But I realized that there's something deeper going on when people get together and laugh together and have a good time together. It's, an, you know, endorphins are released. It's a big deal. So, I, you know, I, I launched into research on the therapy of laughter, the beneficial aspects of positive humor in our lives, using magic as a as a basis to start with and then go on to, you know, Norman Cousins, the anatomy of an illness and and uh, a lot of these other, you know, mind over matter and that kind of stuff. And uh, that became, you know, that set me off on the path of trying to figure out, you know, um, what, what this, what, what is, what, what am I doing there? What am I doing there? Okay. I'm entertaining a bunch of rich tourists. Okay. That's good. But there's other work being done. And then when I would leave and do, do, you know, go on the road and stuff, there's, you know, there's other stuff going on out there uh, than just the pure entertainment. There's, there's, it's, it's something therapeutic. Um, so, um, yeah. So there's a, been another couple of stories in the book that relate to that and, and how important it was. And, and if, if I can, I don't want to uh, give you some of the good stuff from the book, but um, let me tell you this little story here. Um, magic lectures. You know what they are. The mm -hmm. dog and pony show. It's a Tupperware party, right? You mm -hmm. show do the, the dog and pony show, and at the back, right. the thing up. All right. I've, I've been all over, you know, pretty much around the world doing magic lectures, which has been fabulous. 2009, I was invited to go down to uh, to, to uh, Phoenix. I was you know, I was booked at the castle. I was leaving here. I was going to go to Phoenix, then to Palm Springs, and then on into L.A. to do uh, you know I stand at the castle, and so I was going to do a lecture in, in Phoenix and Palm Springs. When I was in Phoenix, I got a phone call from some friends down in um, Tucson, and they said, uh, "Doc, we want to." Uh, We'd love to have, we understand you're in Phoenix. We'd love to have you come down here. We're a great group. We, we buy like crazy, which is all I needed to hear. Right. Uh, uh, okay. So no problem. I'll be there tomorrow evening and we'll do it then. And so I know I drove the two hours from Phoenix down to, to um, Tucson and walked, walked in. I got it all set up here and I got everything's all set to go. The doors were open and five people walk in. Five. I'm going, this is the lecture. This is all the guys I said, yeah, you, you know, you're the fifth guy in two months that we've had to giving lectures down here. Went, oh, God. Uh, so I'm, I'm not really happy with how this is all going here. Sure. So one guy buys something. He bought me the, I bought the copper, silver, brass routine and the coins. 75. Mm -hmm. Right. I drove out of uh, Tucson the next day. Spitting that was up. it? Just the one thing? That's one thing. Oh, yeah. wow. I thought you were going to say that broke the ice and everybody else started buying, but that was just it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Nobody else had any money. They were wow. there for a time, uh, but uh, but no, that was it. So I'm driving out of there, spitting out the window, thinking, why did I ever come to Tucson? This was a complete waste of time. You know, I, I bummed out. So I went to, to on the Palm Springs and went on, and, and I forgot about it. So fast forward to January 2011. Now, the things that are going on at this point, uh, the, now the shootings these days are like a dime a dozen. Every day has some other idiot with a gun. But Unfortunately. back then in 2011, when the Congressman Gabby Gifford was having a little rally there, January of, of, of 2011, the Tucson shooting had just taken place. Um, Gabby Gifford was injured. A little nine-year-old girl was killed. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of other people that were affected. So, so the phone rings. I'm ready, getting ready to go to work uh, up in Snowmass. And I see 520 area code. Hmm, that's Tucson. Maybe it's an order. Let's check it out. Pick up the phone. Hi, it's Doc Eason. Can I help you? He said, Doc, it's Jim Tucker. Jim Tucker. I know that name. He's the one guy that bought something in Tucson. <laughs> Okay. He's my will for Christ's sake. <laughs> yeah, he's your friend. <laughs> uh, 
So and now I'll, I'll dispense with the with the raspy voice and I'll explain it in a moment. But he was talking like this. I could yeah. sort of almost understand him. But okay. Um, I said, Jim Tucker, as I live and breathe, how are you doing? What can I do for you? He said, Well, we had this shooting down here, and I went, Well, yeah, this was two days after it happened. It made all the papers, Jim. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I yeah. Took we have television up here. We've seen the news. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Well, well, I took two bullets. What? And I went, what? Yeah, I took two bullets. One went through my calf, the other lodged uh, uh, under my collarbone. I, they, they're afraid to take it out because they, uh, they're afraid that I might be paralyzed. Holy moly. I said, really? Um, wh where's the congresswoman, Gabby? He said, oh, right next door. I said, are you in the hospital now? You're calling me from the hospital? Yeah. Holy cow. Jim. Uh, I, I, I'm glad to know you're okay. Why are you calling me? He said, well, you remember when you were in Tucson? Oh yeah, I remember. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I bought this, this, uh, this, this trick that requires some manual dexterity. Yeah. He said, well, the doctors want me to do some repetitive motion with my hand. And, and the only thing I can do is that trick. And every time I do it, I think about you. Fuck. It blew my mind. I, I was I uh, I was I, I was stunned, obviously. But I realized why I had to go to Tucson two years before that. I had to get this thing in this guy's hand. So eventually wow. Now, I don't know whether you believe in all that stuff and the coincidental nature of it all. It was just too much for me. It was just too much for me. You know, but that to me is like um, a, a, a moment. I can't even tell the story without choking up about it. He's fine. He's doing great. I talk to him probably two or three times a year. He calls me just out of the clear blue. You know, I'm thinking about you and we're doing this, that, and the other thing. I'm thinking it's a coin trick. You know, it's the first one I ever learned. Okay. Mm -hmm. I gave it, you know, I let this guy have it. And now he's, you know, he's, back operational and his hands work and everything's fine. So anyway, it's, it's, it's things like that, that and after this many years of doing this, you know, cause I'm looking for some kind of meaning in my life at this point, you know, in terms of you know, why, it, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people out there thinking, you know, childish ways, you know, give up the childish ways, you know, card tricks or, you know, well, not, I think there's some actual therapeutic value in, in that, you know, um, and, and what we do. So anyway, uh, uh, waxing a little too philosophical here at this point, but you, you get the picture. Well, yeah. Uh, and as you were telling me yesterday about how when you had laid out all of these different pictures and your diary and whatnot, of where have you have been on a timeline on your table yeah. and going for like eight feet long. And you're thinking, wow, how could I have done this? I was on this cruise ship and I went to Boston and I was at the tower. I was down in Houston and et cetera, et cetera. And on the cruise ships, so it's just that you have just, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of experience and wondering how that you could encompass all this in one life. And if you stop and think about all the people who didn't call you, whose lives have been touched in certain ways about how that whatever you said or did had positively influenced their lives. That one person that, that Jim had called you had was just a representative of others who haven't. There's another way yeah. of looking at this. Yeah. Well, and once, and yes, that's and absolutely true. Um, uh, and I'm, you know, being where I, uh, the fact that I was in this place for as long as I was, people would come back year after year after year after year. So I was lucky enough to get some of these stories or, or to, for people to tell me how much they affected it. You know, sure. there's a kid that's the, the, the not a kid anymore because he's a grown man, but he got, got him behind. I used to get, I used to bring kids behind the bar. Oh, my son does magic. Good. Come on back here. Get him up on the platform, stand up <laughs> on one of the ice buckets. And so he's tall enough to do it. And um, it's five minutes that I don't have to do. And this <laughs> exactly is, is, uh, is, is thrilled because he behind the bar at the tower in snow mass. I mean, he's working his magic there. Well, this kid uh, went on to become but uh, work at Disney, he got uh, he was going to school in Florida, got a, a medical degree, and would do occasional things like that. He's a, he's a magician, um, but he's also a doctor. Um, 
and it, it's because of his experience there at the tower, you know, um, there's a really good friend of mine, uh, uh, R.J. Owens. Um, he was living in San Francisco at the time. Um, when, when I when I met him, he's about 30 years old, and I met him. Um, and uh, let me think, how do I launch in the story? All right, back a magic lecture again. Okay, I'm I'm mm-hmm. coming up from L.A. I finished the, the castle, came up to San Francisco. I'm going to do a lecture in, in uh, San Francisco. Joe Pon. Uh, misdirection. Oh, sure. He has a magic shop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the guy, the organizer. You know, at any time a guy like me on the lecture circuit, you know, you head to the guy that's got all the information and you figure out where you're staying, what you're doing, what you know. Right, right. So I pull in there um, and uh, introduce myself to, to uh, Joe. And um, I say, okay, Joe, um, I, I, I want to see if I can cop a little nap before I, I, I get on there. Where am I staying? Because as you may well know, you know it's it's wherever forty nine ninety five buys, right? <laughs> right. Or room. I mean, a kid, you know, it's a red roof inn, you know, yeah. in a in a squirrely area of town. <laughs> so I, you know, here I am, San Francisco. Uh, where am where am I staying? He says, "Oh, you're staying at the Sir Francis Drake." And I went, "Sir Francis Drake? Uh, that's that boutiquey little hotel down and down by Union Square." And yes, it yeah. Um, that that's the hotel I'm staying at. I said, yeah. Um, go down there. Uh, where, where and where am I lecturing? Right there in the basement of, in one of the meeting rooms downstairs. And I was going, at the hotel. Wow. That's, yeah. Okay. Fine. So um, he said, uh, drive your car down there. Leave it at valet parking, and um, um, go up to the lobby. You got to take an escalator up into this opulent lobby with full of marble and gold leaf and just unbelievable. All right. He said, uh, 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 be on the lookout. Your your biggest fan is there. I didn't know what that meant. I walked up as I cleared the room. I'm, I'm basking in this luxurious hotel uh, lobby. I look down. There's a desk at the far end. I see this huge guy stand up and put his hand flat on the desk, bolt over the desk and make a beeline for me. Now, I'm, you know, I'm, this guy is um, six foot seven, weighs about 375 pounds. All right. Now I'm six two. I don't look up to a lot of people. When I do, I'm aware that I'm looking up at them. Okay. Sure. I'm at this monster, you know, bearing He's down. Towering. Yeah. <laughs> gives me a big bear hug. I'm glad you're here. Signs me in. Takes me up to the top floor. Now, you know, there's you know, it's only eight floors in this thing, but uh, the local Bon Vivant. I don't know what it, you know. Harry Denton. It's he owns the whole top floor. Okay, fine. I got one of the little bedrooms. Now, I walked in there, and I've never been in a brothel, but this looks like it would, would be a hike. <laughs> what with, you would with, imagine it would look like, yeah. All three palm things and red velvet and green velvet and all this. Stuff. It's, it's just right, opulent. I haven't been in a room like this ever, okay? So I go downstairs. I get a little nap. I go downstairs. Um, I walk into the meeting room, and the meeting room is set for 100 people. Now, you know, magic lectures, if you get 35, that's a pretty good size. Okay? Yeah, outside of a convention, you're not going to get that kind of a group, right? A hundred seats, and they had, then they had to bring more in because more people showed up. I'm just going, what the hell is this all about? Wow. So, and and uh, many well-posted magicians from the Bay Area are, came out to see me. I was just, I was, you know, humbled at the, at the crowd. <sighs> Uh, we finished the we finished the lecture. They bought everything I had. I could have sold them my underwear out of my thing. I mean, they were just buying everything. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sitting there with the pockets bulging full of money and and credit card slips and this is unbelievable. <clears throat> so he says, "Are you hungry?" And I went, "Yeah." As a matter of fact, I am. Now I'm thinking Denny's all night. You know, sure. Egg, yeah. Greasy well, egg. Yeah. Right? Oh no 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 no. Get the no, grand no. slam. We're down to get down to basement flo- uh, level. Uh, Scala's five star restaurant. The place is deserted. The, con- the, the concierge, who was, who was uh, RJ, uh, told the um, kitchen that he has a VIP uh, in town, keep the place open. We're going to have dinner later. Okay. So we sit down at a dinner. And if this is a full tilt, ap- appetizers, entrees, desserts, you know, this is unbelievable. I, the food was fabulous. So we go into the bar. Now, in a bar, in a San Francisco, in the bar, you can't smoke inside and you can't drink outside. So we spent a lot of we spent a lot of time in the doorway with a drink in one hand and a cigar in the other hand that he produced. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just 
I'm just, my head is reeling. I'm just, you know, this is unbelievable. Um, so he takes a big hint of cigar and gets real close to the dock. When I was 14 years old, my mom and dad took me to Aspen, Colorado. And I sat at your bar. And this, my friend, is payback. Huh. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? All right. So, I mean, when I it was like Willy Wonka on the uh, elevator. <laughs> Oof, all the way into the stratosphere. It was like, what? It, this is unbelievable. Because I was nice to a 14-year-old kid who, you know, at six foot six and 300 pounds, you know, he was a pretty gawky kid probably at age 14. But he discovered magic watching me work and went off and became, well, now, uh, well, not, he, 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 the Cirque du Soleil came through San Francisco and they picked him out of the thing. And he was the baby in Mystere, you know, oh. and Mystere is like one of the longest running Cirque shows ever, um, mm -hmm. up until last March anyway. Um, so he, I mean, he's, he, he's, it's established he's making tons was making tons of money i don't know how what, what he's doing these days uh this damn COVID thing um but uh so it's it's incidents like that that keep me going you know I sure mean, just uh well magic is a performing art and when you stop and think about what how people react to art we all react differently when we go to a museum we go for different reasons we some people maybe drug along with uh, someone who wants to go there some people want to go there for inspiration some people are killing time some people uh, like a particular artist and they've got a gallery that's going to be showing this person's artwork or whatever it is uh, and even after you get there you may or may not necessarily be inspired to to like that i know when you come to houston that you like to go to the rothko for an example and just sit and meditate and just look at the Rothko beautiful paintings there. Uh, it, it, and then likewise, I think that with magic, again, being a performing art, that people are looking at us uh, and experiencing it at different levels, if you will. Uh, and, and you may not know, again, how that a person is being affected by our art, you know? It could be that they like cards, maybe that they don't like cards, but uh, you really don't know until uh, sometimes, in your case, a year or many years later. Yes, yeah, and you never, you, you know, you can't plan on it, and you don't, you know, and I go in every, I don't go in every night, or didn't go in every night thinking about, you know, what's going to happen tonight, so it's going to, you know, feed <laughs> Right. Well, you were talking also then about researching the importance of uh, a therapy of laughter and all that. And then you were giving a lot of talks. I know you kind of, uh, after the tower had closed, that you kind of uh, started doing a series of um, engagements and talking to different groups as an after dinner speaker kind of a thing. And that was, I, Banachek and I attended that one, I remember for you, and you brought people on a roller coaster of laughter to tearful, uh, emotional crying. Uh, back and forth. I mean, it was just uh, a, a great talk, and I'm sure you were successful with that. Well, I, I, yes, um, it was a fun thing to do, and it was a real departure from it because it wasn't about magic at that point. I used magic to illustrate points and stuff, but it wasn't. It wasn't a magic show. Right. But I did that talk in the afternoon after lunch, and then went to the hospitality suite at that night. I, you know, I was a, you know. A, 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 it was a popular thing to do. I made really good money doing it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's what's driving me nuts about what's going on now is that is, 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 is lack of work because we can't, uh, it just, it's killing me. Uh, and as far as the Zoom shows, I, 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 I cannot get my arms all the way around uh, Zoom shows. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't fit for me. Um, but it's 73 years old over here. It sounds like now that what you're doing is launching into uh, going back into time and putting together this book. And so it sounds like that you're kind of moving along well. Do you have any idea when you think you might come to an end on that or when the book might get published? I mean, you're really at the beginning stages, and usually it takes a year or two or more to kind of put something like that together. What are you thinking? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking um, I'm thinking you're right, and I'm thinking <laughs> Now, a lot of these, uh, I put down some rough copies of this when you know, the tower shut down 16 years ago. Um, and, uh, been, you know, been playing with it here and there. But for the last four months, I'm not doing anything else. I may as well write this damn book. So, um, and I, 
Obviously, if anybody's even tried to do this, you're not writing a book, you're rewriting it and then rewriting it again and rewriting. Mm -hmm. Got my computer open now. I just, God, I just kidding. Um, and I have an editor who's keeping me on track and, and making suggestions and rewriting this and helping me do that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, that's what my primary aim is right now. Besides that, I also fell in love. I'm, I'm at 73. I never thought it would happen for me again. Uh, but Jeannie's come into my life and, and uh, life is, um, I don't know how I would have done this had I did not had not my partner with me on this thing. It, it's, um, uh, yeah, I just don't know what. It's great the, to find love late in life then too. Yeah. And, it's not, and, and then it's an age old story. I've known, I know her from the old days, from the 40 years ago when I got here, you know, mm -hmm. she, he was working for John Denver and, you know, she'd been married once and, and again twice and then another third time. So she married a, uh, a trust funder the first time, a um, drug dealer the second time and a pervert the third time. And wow. now she's hanging out with a magician. So uh, <laughs> it's more than a trifecta. What would that be? I guess <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. it's dangerous is whatever it is. Anyway. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And it sounds like that uh, things have come together and I'm so glad to uh, reconnect and have a chance to chat with you here this afternoon. Uh, as yeah. I close over here, one of the things uh, I always like to close with my podcast is, is the name of the t podcast is called the magic word podcast. And so I, I like to know what it is that your magic word, not necessarily a word, but what is the philosophy of life? What do you live by? I mean, when you go back and look at the, the expanse of your repertoire what you have done in your life your experiences and what it is that has brought you to where you are today and where you want to go tomorrow and you when you wake up in the morning what drives you what's your philosophy of life <laughs> when did you tell me this yesterday when i was <laughs> I'm thinking about it Just bring me in there. um Jesus, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm momentarily stumped. I don't know what, what gets me out of bed at, in, in the morning, um, uh, other than making coffee for Jeannie and me. Um, I, I um, my philosophy of life, my God, spring this on me at the last minute like this. Um, <laughs> can I mail it in? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, these days, you know, this, this is, these were not normal times, you know, so it's, it's kind of hard for me to think about, um, what my philosophy of life is when I can't work, you know, I'm, it's, yeah. it's killing me that I'm not able to go out there and say, what's your name again? And where are you from? And, and, uh, and it's, it's having fun with the folks. Um, well, I think that's kind of what that you have, uh, been living is having fun with folks and, and, and wanting to do that again as soon as you can and yeah. just, uh, it, it, enjoying life. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but, but well, no, I'm certainly enjoying life. There's certainly worse places in the world to carry out a pandemic than in Basalt, Colorado. I mean, you know, we're eating well, we're, you know, fine. Jeannie uh, still has a job. I've got a little nest egg that I'm pulling off now and then, you know, every, every, it's all good. Um, um, uh, so, but it's, it, but I'm not doing what I'm put on the, on the earth for That's I think that's what it is. Basically my, my feel, my reason for being here is to lighten people's load and, and have a good, you know, have good fun, create laughter and, uh, and try and stay above the bullshit. Um, and so I guess that's basically it, you know, I want to lighten other people's loads, you know, uh, there's a lot of other people out there worse, a lot worse than I am, uh, worse off than I am. And uh, it's, 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 it's a very, it's a very strange time in America. Let's put it that way. That's it. I think you've uh, summarized it quite well right there. That's a good way of putting a cap on that. Thanks, Doc. You bet, Jim. <laughs> that is great to talk to you. We don't see each other nearly enough, especially these days. Um, hopefully we can sit across the table from each other and have a martini. And a cigar. Look and forward to it, my friend. So until uh, next time, that was Doc Eason. This is Scotty out. Thank you, Doc. What a great conversation that was. 
lots of good advice and some uh, historical background on some of the things you've done. Uh, some stories you've shared with me in the past, but I'm glad you had an opportunity to share these with the rest of the listeners. So thank you guys very much again for coming in this week and for watching this. I want to encourage you again, while you're watching this on YouTube, you might as well go ahead and hit subscribe and subscribe to this channel. So this way that you can keep up to date with everything that's going on then with the Magic Word Podcast. Also, if you would please go to the Magic Word Podcast com and there you will be able to subscribe to the pod letter again so you can find out what's going to be going on from week to week and also suggestions from the archives well this has been a delightful uh, hour we spent here together thank you very much again for joining us and so until next week stay well get booked and remember to lighten people's load have good fun create laughter <laughs> and stay above the bs <laughs> this is scotty out <laughs>